Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, we appreciate it. My name is Javier Gutierrez, uh, Product Engineer Lead in the Web 3D JavaScript API scene viewer. And with me is Jesse. He's a senior developer. We're both working on the Zurich office in the R&D Center in Switzerland. And we're very happy to be here with you today to present about uh, the JavaScript API and getting started with 3D in the JavaScript API. So let's get started. But before, maybe some of you already have a lot of 3D requirements, 3D use cases, and maybe some of you are like, why do we have to do this 3D thing? Um, I'm happy with my maps. I already learned how to use scales and zooms, and now I need to learn about all these new things. Well, actually, we have, we hear a lot of requirements from a lot of different industries, and, and we, we get a lot of requests from many users in all these different industries that you see here. From, ranging from scientific visualization to mining, oil and gas, energy, uh, environmental assessment, transportation, like aeronautical, um, nautical transportation. Um, we actually are focusing more on the bottom uh, aspect, so uh, city planning, city monitoring, facility management, utilities and telecommunication, everything related to urban systems, urban planning, urban development, land management, real estate, um, and, and infrastructure management. Um, we, we get a lot of requests. We actually have very strong competition from, from our colleagues and, and out there. And there's really a lot of uh, push from the community to, to get all of this working on the web. Um, yeah, other companies are doing a great job in having everything on your phone and, and making this pervasive. Everybody can do a lot of things on their phone nowadays. So the expectation is that it just works on the web. So that's why we're here. That's why we are as we putting a lot of effort into making uh, awesome JavaScript API and awesome web experience where you can leverage all your 3D data, all your 2D data, all your rasters, your imagery, your features, all in one web application in 3D or in 2D. But let's talk about it uh, a bit more. So how does 3D in the browser work in the RJS platform? I think you all know about, uh, you've seen this slide probably a number of times. The RGS platform is a system for managing and applying geographic information. So it's a platform for mapping and location. The core of it is RGS Online in the enterprise. And um, it's powered by server in the enterprise. It's part, powered by online services in the cloud. And you can consume it from desktop machines and desktop native applications, from native devices, or from the web. And that's where we're here, in the, on the web part. As we already provides out of the box 3D web applications. The scene viewer is the uh, entry point, if you will, to create web scenes and consume web scenes, uh, to mash up all your different layers that you already have in RGS Online. Story Maps provides this more vertical um, experience to create stories, to tell stories uh, with your already created web scenes. You can combine web maps and web scenes together in one story map. And the Web App Builder allows you to configure the experience, configure the widgets, configure the look and feel, and even write your own widget. However, you're here as developers, you want to learn how to create your own custom 3D web apps, like uh, to add different components and to add different functionality that we don't provide, at least not yet. Um, so let's talk about it. Uh, the RGIS API for JavaScript. Um, this API provides visual mapping components and widgets. It supports multiple layer types. We'll look at uh, all of these in more detail later in the presentation. And integrates well with the RGS platform. This is a bit of a change with 3X and 4X. But in this presentation, we're only talking about 4X. 3D is only available in 4X. And the integration level of the 4X API with the platform is really high. We really put a lot of effort into making integration RGS online or RGS enterprise, enterprise seamless. You can get it today. It's, uh, publicly hosted, that's the URL, and you can go to the developer site to get more information. And 3D itself in the JS API is new. Like I mentioned, it's only in 4X. Uh, a few years ago in 3X, we didn't have 3D in JavaScript. But so what is all this 3D about? Uh, 3D can work with your existing data, with 2D tiles, with maps, with elevation data, raster, with features. It also works with specific 3D, 3D layers called scene layers. Uh, we'll also see some of that a bit later. 
and introduces some new concepts that didn't exist in 2D mapping, uh, 2D JavaScript before, which are uh, the type of web scene or type of scene. We have two types, local and global. We also see some examples. And it also introduces something new, which is the ground surface. All your maps already have a surface. It's the background of your map, right? You see that there. But in 3D, when you look at it from, from the side, you actually could go underground. And you have this layer which represents the surface of the Earth. And that's a ground. That's a very important component of, of 3D. Uh, we also want to talk a little bit about camera, light, and shadows. But uh, we also have a new session, uh, another session, uh, advanced concepts, that will cover that in more detail. And what are the requirements to run 3D in your browser? Well, nowadays, not many, actually. You just need to use a modern web browser with WebGL enabled, which means IE11 or, or newer. So I think we're pretty good by now. Um, luckily, IE10 is uh, past. <laughs> and we need modern hardware with graphics card. Actually, we, we recommend that you have a dedicated graphics card in your machine when you run uh, a web application in 3D. But nowadays, we see a lot of integrated graphics cards that are quite fast as well. So it will depend, performance will depend. We always get the question, how much can I run? How fast will it run? And performance will depend a lot on the data that you have in your scene. So be mindful of this. If you need to render a lot of geometry, a lot of data, you will need a good graphics card. If you need just some lines, light scenes, then you will be happy with uh, just an integrated Intel graphics card. I have a question for you. How many of you know already about this promise Promises and properties, can you raise your hand? All right, very good. Um, for those of you who don't know, I have the links here in the API guide page to learn about this. These are very important concepts, switching from 3x to 4x to learn how the API is working. Mainly promises, you will see a lot of dot .den, dot, dot .catch. Uh, this is a, an asynchronous way of, hand, or a way of handling asynchronous operations. You have the slides, like I mentioned, uh, up there in GitHub. So go and click on those links and read. Also, autocasting, loadable, TypeScript. There's a lot of concepts in the SDK that are really useful to read through. Let's now go a little bit more detail into the API and how to build 3D web apps. A bit of history, a 3x architecture. Very simple. We had the map and the layers, and we rendered the map and the layers. And the web map was there. You could kind of import a web map. Um, but in Forex, we actually had to make a little bit of changes. Uh, the first one is we wanted to separate the view and the model. So, which that means whatever describes the content of the map, how it looks, which layers we have, that's in, in the map part and the layer part. However, whatever renders that content is what we call the view. And why did we do that? Because we needed to render it in two different ways. We need to render it now in 2D or in 3D. In 2D, we use DOM to render. And in 3D, we use WebGL to render. So for the same layer and for the same map and for the same symbol, if you choose map view, we will render in the DOM. And if you choose scene view, we will render in WebGL. So that's why we needed this separation. Actually, that is, that, that is actually a little bit mixed now because um, the map view now supports feature layer WebGL rendering and WebTurtal WebGL rendering. Um, this is just, yeah, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, it's still, that this separation still exists. So we have map view that renders things in one way and the scene view in another way. And another important part is, is the model. Now we extended it with WebMap and WebScene full integration. Like I mentioned, the Forex API is well integrated with the platform. So when you create a web scene or a web map, you can use it right away in your, in your API and even save it back. Let's talk a bit more about 3D. And for that, I'll pass it on to Jesse. Thank you. All right, is that visible? Mm -hmm. Yes. OK, so I will talk a bit about API concepts. So what does it mean? How do you write the actual code? Um, where you can use the scene view, what are the new concepts, how do you control basic camera, this kind of things. Um, all the, also the presentation that's online, it's on GitHub, all the code is there uh, for you to look at, uh, all the snippets that we show, and you can run it also uh, in your browser. So I'm gonna sit down because I have to interact a little bit. Um, so working with the scene view, when you start out, um, I always like this example where 
Basically, if you have your app and it uses a map view, so it's, this is in 4X, if you change map view with scene view, basically everything works and now it's in 3D. Um, that's kind of the, like the, the simplest way to introduce somebody to, to 3D. So we tried to make this very low friction um, and I will explain a little bit uh, about, about how that works. Um, here I have an example. So this is a 2D map. So you can see when I, when I rotate it, um, this is basically 2D. Um, okay. That's the demo effect, I guess. So when I run this snippet, basically what I did is I just do the same thing, but I replace map view with scene view. And actually it looks pretty much the same, but now when I tilt, uh, you can see that actually we are doing everything in 3D and you can zoom out to the globe. Um, so that's really kind of as simple as it gets. Uh, just replace it, now it's in 3D, and you can start kind of enhancing your data or your layers to add more 3D content into your, into your scene. So it's kind of an incremental, or we try to make this very incremental process. So what does it mean working with the scene view? So like Javi said, we have this unified 2D and 3D data model, right? So you have the map, works in both in 2D and 3D, um, we have layers, renders, symbology, all of that stuff uh, exists exactly like that in 3D as well. But there are some small differences or sometimes large differences. Um, we have this common view subclass between 2D and 3D, but then specific classes that either render in 2D or in 3D. Um, and we try to really make this transition easy. But like this is an easy way to get started, but if you really want to exploit 3D, um, there's a couple of things that you need to learn that didn't exist in 2D. So let's look at some of the, um, I'm gonna show some examples, uh, run through some code and just get, get you kind of a feeling of like how you would work with it. Um, some of the properties that are kind of important to know about um, on the scene view are the camera. I will talk about that more. Um, so where in 2D you are familiar with scale and center and extent, um, our primary definition of where you are at um, in, the, in the world is the camera. Um, then we have a couple of methods that are very useful. These also exist on the map view, uh, but they work a little bit differently. Um, so we have go to to do animations or framing certain uh, graphics or geometries. Uh, we have hit test to find graphics in the scene. And we have uh, methods to convert coordinate systems between screen space and map space. So let's look a little bit at the camera. So this is our primary specification. The camera consists of three properties. Uh, one is position. It's an an, an actual geometry, a point geometry, but has a, a Z uh, coordinate. So it's just a 3D position. It's defined in map coordinates and it's 3D position on the world. And then we have heading and tilt, which will define like at what angle basically in 3D you're looking at things. Uh, heading is, is basically like rotation, right? That you know that from 2D. Uh, tilt is the new thing where you actually tilt down or up the camera. So let's look at some really, really simple like examples of how you can manipulate um, the camera. In, in this example, so one thing that's important to note is that the camera is immutable. Like we, we have to emphasize this quite a lot um, because people run into this. If you modify the camera on the view directly, it, it doesn't really apply any of the values. So you always have to clone it, modify it, and set it back. The, if you look at the SDK, it will explain this as well. That's why you see here where, that I clone the camera first. So if I play this, Basically what I do is I just increment the heading property and then I set the new camera. Um, when I play this snippet, what you can see, and I, I press it a couple of times, is that the camera rotates around, sorry, rotates around the point of where it's located. All right, so it just turns around. So simple. Go to is kind of the more like powerful version of controlling the camera in a sense. With GoTo, there's a, it has a very large signature. You can do all kinds of stuff with it. Mainly, we use it to frame certain things. So you can pass in an extent, and it will just frame that extent in a way that kind of makes sense in 3D. Um, and the other thing is that it does animations. So here I have two simple examples. Basically, I kind of do a similar thing. I want to change the heading. Um, but this time, I will change it in multiples of 30 degrees. And then I will use GoTo to animate. So here you see like short animations. Each time the camera is turning 30 degrees, basically. So you may notice that the heading, when I set the heading with go to, I actually rotate around my current focus points in the scene. So it's now rotating around this point like this. 
well, before if I change the heading of the camera, it's rotating around the point of the camera. We do this because we consider on the view, like the, the point of interest, the center of the view to be the interesting point. And if you change heading, we think that it's more common that you want to change the heading around that point. Um, with the go to, so this is a little bit new, newer, that you have also go to animation options. Um, we added options that where you can control the actual speed of the animation in a controllable way, but also the easing. So like the way that it either accelerates or decelerates. Um, here I have the same example. Um, we'll actually rotate in 120 degrees, but now I slowed it down by a factor of uh, 20%. And I'll have an, an easing function that basically eases out. So let's try and see. So I can see it's much slower and it kind of, kind of it starts fast and then it kind of slows down. Um, there's many, so there's other options here. Uh, you can look at the SDK and, and play around with GoTo. To map to screen and hit test, I made a small example combining these two, these three concepts. Um, to map is the, the method that converts screen coordinates, so pixel positions in the, in the view to map coordinates. So it does basically an intersection in the scene and figures out where the, that point intersects with 3D geometry. To screen is the, uh, is the opposite of that. So you do, you give it a map point and you get a screen point back. Uh, and hit test is a general uh, way of figuring out what graphic actually is under a specific pixel position. So these things are, are also like that in 2D. Um, but in 3D, we have to really like intersect a long array in 3D space. So this, this snippet, what it does, if I run like the first thing here, um, basically it will add four graphics at uh, like 30% pixel size of the screen. I will just run it and you will see what happens. So, so here I have these four spheres. So basically used to map to convert screen coordinates to map coordinates and then place the graphics in the scene. Um, for hit test, actually, I realized that I cannot show the example because it uses pointer move and I'm on the iPad. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. But basically, what happens is that when you move the pointer, um, you would switch. Can switch. Oh, yeah. Let's do that. So let me add this. Um, you can see, so when I move the pointer, I will do a hit test each time. And then if I find the graphic, I will show the x, y attributes that I, that I added here in the graphic in this little window here. So you can see each time it hits something, basically, uh, you can figure out about the stuff that, you, that, your, that your mouse cursor is on. So you can use this to do all kinds of things like showing more information about the thing that you're hoovering over and stuff like that. Yeah. Switch back. Okay. So, so the map, uh, Javier already mentioned, so the map is still the kind of the core class that works both in map view and scene view. Um, we have the base map, it works exactly the same. You can have tile layers in there. We, project them onto the ground surface. Um, what is different in 3D, we also, the map has a ground property, and that is where we store the elevation sources. Elevation sources are elevation layers. I will explain them a bit more um, afterwards. And we have kind of a similar easy way to set up the world elevation, uh, elevation source. So this like base map, when you say, I want the topo base map, for example, it's an easy way to construct that whole base map based on that definition. Um, we have that for the world elevation service. Um, other things are going to come uh, to, the, to this ground surface. Right now, it's only elevation sources, but we're going to add additional properties on there that control how the surface is being visualized. So you can think about uh, wireframe, uh, different kind of shadings, um, that kind of stuff. So layers. Um, so this is the, the list of layers. Basically, we support all the layers that, that are supported in 2D. Um, so feature layer, CSV layer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have the dynamic layers, map image, imagery layer, so that's image server and map server. Um, the WMS layer, uh, all the tiled layers, so all of, that, all of those layers work um, basically the same as in 2D. Um, what is, like one of the things that you have to, or that you can, that, that we can do in 3D is to elevate um, basically graphics. And so when you look at the feature layer, all the, if the features are all 
basically you have no Z information, uh, we can still decide to maybe offset them in, in the world so that we can get a better perspective. Um, this is what we call elevation info. That's where that is stored. Um, I will talk here. So this example has the three that we, that we used to have since the beginning, which is relative to ground, absolute height, and on the ground. And what you can see here, um, basically on the ground, we'll drape it, project it onto the ground terrain surface. Absolute height will just offset it from sea level. Uh, and relative to ground, uh, we'll offset it based on the ground surface. So it's like a couple of like, N meters above ground. There's different use cases for each of these. Um, by default, the default of this depends on the data type. Um, it will be on the ground for if you don't have Z values. Relative to scene is new. Um, we'll actually show this in a bit later in a separate app. Um, we'll talk about that, what that means. Um, basically, well, you can guess from the name. So things are elevated relative to the scene. But we'll, we'll see that. So what about layers in 3D? So there's layer types that Javi already mentioned that only work in 3D, and they are specifically made for 3D content. Um, the four layers that we have are elevation layer. So this is what is the, like what makes up the ground surface. And then there's the, the various types of scene service layers. So scene layer, integrated mesh layer, point cloud layer, and we'll, we'll go over all of these in more detail. The elevation layer is basically based on elevation services. Those are tiled image services, actually, like raster image services. And they are served out in Lurk format. Um, the, basically, what I already mentioned, so you add them to the ground. You can have multiple elevation layers that kind of overlay in the same way as tiled raster layers do. Um, so wherever, like the topmost, uh, we'll render it first if there's data there. If there's no data there, we, we go down and down, etc. Um, there's a couple of, of methods on there that are interesting. Um, it's, it's a bit like the, the query methods that you would have on a feature layer. On elevation layers, we also have query methods that can query elevation. What is new is that we also have a way now to create elevation samplers, which means that you can get uh, like a sampler for a specific extent of your map, and then you can synchronously sample elevation values from that. Um, this can be useful to draw like elevation profiles, for example, or doing interactive, uh, interactive elevation sampling. Let's have a quick look. Uh, this is a small example uh, where we have multiple elevation layers. So that's the world elevation layer. Um, I can turn here on and off. So this is like a landslide uh, elevation source. And you can see how basically before and after um, the elevation changed in that region. If I click here on the map, I will use an elevation query, which will basically go to the servers, figure out like where I clicked, go to the servers, get a tile back, figure out what the elevation value was there, and then display it here. So if I click around, you can see that I get different elevation values. Scene layers uh, support two different types of data, um, a little bit similar to the feature layer. So the first one that I want to show is points. This is um, like the feature layer with points, but the thing that we want to do with that is to show much, much more data. And this is basically in an LOD level of detail service. So when you're far away, you get a couple of points. And then when you zoom in more and more, you get more and more data. So this is an, a layer with airports. Um, I can zoom in a little bit. And we'll see that the more I zoom in, the more details I get, basically. This works with regular uh, point symbology, so you can symbolize uh, these airboards uh, the way that you would like with, with symbology. I will talk a little bit about symbology after. The second type of scene layer is what we call the 3D object scene layer. These are proper 3D meshes that are being streamed to the browser now. So the most common case that you will see is, is buildings. So each, so 3D objects are like features, right? So this is not. I will show an example of uh, more like a, a general mesh. Uh, but here you can see that there's individual features. So when I, when I click, for example, on this building, when I click on that building, let me try it again. So you see that it's being highlighted. We have pop-ups, we have attributes on those. So those work very similar to features, to feature layer. So this is basically 3D, 3D features, 3D objects we call them.
X. So if you don't have features, um, there is another type of layer that streams 3D content. So all of these 3D content layers, they're actually based on the same uh, backend service. This is what we call the scene server. It has different profiles with different data types. Um, one of them is integrated mesh. Integrated meshes are often recorded from, for example, drone survey data, so the, like drone to map, for example, or RICOM uh, data. So these are really um, just a, like a, a soup of tri or triangle soup, as we call them. So there's no attributes here, at least not yet. There's no features. Uh, it's just one big block of 3D geometry. Um, you can see that they can get quite detailed. Um, the same things apply. So we have LOD on these. When you zoom out, they get lower quality or we, they get reduced. Uh, and when you zoom in, you get more and more details. Point cloud layers are the last layer type. Uh, it's also, again, a scene service, but with a different profile. Uh, point clouds are um, data that, that people often have because it's really kind of simple to record. There's, no, there's, not, there's a bit of filtering and noise reduction, but then there's no 3D surface reconstruction. Uh, so it's basically individual measured points. And these can, be, these can get really, really large. So these layers can have billions and billions of points. Um, and they are streamed in a similar way to the browser, so we only see a subset of them. But you can control on those kind of layers is uh, things like the point size. So if I, if I increase here, if I increase this, uh -huh. like that, so you can see the point size change. I can, I can increase, so if I want to get kind of more detail, uh, what I can do is decrease the point size and increase the, the density. And now I get a much more detailed view. Uh, so these are the kind of things that you control on these type of layers. So I want to talk um, a little bit about symbology. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail. So if you want more detail, there is also a talk on data visualization in 3D. Um, so you can go there and get more information about, about symbology and renderers and how you can visualize your data. I'll just show a little bit here. So the way that we split up the symbology, it works a little bit different than in 2D. Um, but what we do is, so the, Above, you see kind of the geometry type. So we have points, lines, and polygons for 3D symbology. And then we have two rows. The first row is what we call flat symbology. So this is more like a 2D uh, visualization of that, of that feature. And then below, we have what we call the volumetric symbology. For symbology. And this is basically the same geometry, but shown in a 3D way. And the example here that you can see, so we have icons, lines, and fills. So these are like in 2D. Um, and then in 3D, when you, when you represent the same geometries, um, we call those objects, paths, and extrude. So basically extrude is extruded polygons, right? So you can have a polygon, like building footprint, extrude them out. Um, paths are like lines, but they are basically tubes in 3D. And then objects can be symbolized by either primitive objects or complex uh, 3D models. So let's look at a little example of a renderer. So if you're familiar with symbology and renderers, really the concepts are exactly the same. Um, so what we do here is we have a visual variable. Um, it will basically colorize based on the construction year. It has two stops um, before 1915 and after 2015. And you can see that we color the 3D meshes um, like this. So these are uh, basically simple fill symbols. One of the, um, of the kind of n the latest symbol, and this is a bit of a special symbol, is what we call a web style symbol. Um, web styles are hosted on RGS Online, uh, and they contain, it's like a gallery of, of symbology. Uh, it's both 2D icons and 3D object models. And I will show a small example. So basically, the way that you reference them is by uh, an, an item on RGS Online. We call those web style items. And then you can select certain uh, like objects by name out of uh, certain categories of items. So I'll show an example. So these are the categories that we have right now. And we are expanding these. Let's go and look at transportation. I will. Here I have the list of all the, the symbols in this category. 
And let's look at a sailboat. So this is a, a playground that you can find online. If you go to the SDK, uh, you can find a link to it and you can kind of play around with different symbologies. Um, so this is the boat. Um, I can go and choose another one. I will show one more. Let's try the crane. Right, so. And the nice thing about this playground, what I like is that sometimes it's pretty cumbersome to actually type up the code to put these things in your scene or in your app. So here you have different like representations of that code. So this is like an autocast way of representing that you can just copy paste this in your app. Um, this is if you want to actually construct this, the, the objects and yourself and stuff like that. This works also for other symbology. Uh, this playground is pretty cool. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, about the web scene. I have not really talked about this yet. Um, so we were still using maps mostly. So mostly, so the map is this thing where uh, it has the properties that are common between 2D and 3D, um, but it doesn't actually persist anywhere. This is really like the core, the core base map, uh, not the base map, the base map. So the web scene is uh, like the what we call the portal information model version of the map for 3D. It defines the content and the style of a 3D scene. Um, so, and then it's serialized as JSON and stored in, in ArcGIS Online. Um, the, um, the web scene has a specification that you can, that you can look at. It's, it's the same or very similar to the web map specification, if, you're, if you are familiar with that. And it contains a bunch more stuff. Uh, it has all the, the layers, the base map, but also presentation, like slides, uh, the initial state of the, the camera and the lighting information. Uh, and then it has this, this meta, metadata about what kind of scene it is, spatial reference, the version, etc. If you are interested in this, um, you can go here. All the, the spec is, is online on the, on the developer's website. Um, it's basically using JSON schema. And then you can just look at, uh, at like what all the things are that define a full web scene. In the API, we have the web scene class that represents that document. Uh, it's only supported by scene view. So if you use web scenes, uh, you cannot view them in a map view. Map view is web maps and scene view is, is web scenes. You can load them from portal. Um, these are the kind of some of the, the properties that it adds on top of the map. So this is a map subclass. It adds presentation, slides, the initial view property. So when the web scene is assigned to view, where should the camera be? What should the lighting be? Uh, what is the viewing mode? So we have this local and global. I will, I will show you this in a minute. Um, and there's a portal item potentially associated with that, with that web scene. Um, we'll show in, uh, in the app that we'll show afterwards. Uh, after this, we'll show how you can load and save actually to, to online. There's also a clipping area. Um, clipping area is important for local mode. So what we have, what we call local mode is a planar projection of the, of the scene. These are useful if you want to focus on a small region and only show data there, but also if you want to show underground data. So I'll show this, this sample, you can, it's in the SDK. Uh, you may already have seen it. Um, this sample will show you kind of the benefits of like local mode. So here there's data underground. If you would have the globe, we don't currently, at least, allow you to go under the globe. Um, but here you can focus on the small region in the, in the world. You have data underground, you can kind of navigate and, and visualize the data. So that's uses for both local and global. Um, global only supports Web Mercator and WS84 projections, um, while in local we support any PCS. That's uh, basically, if you have any kind of PCS that is not Web Mercator, uh, then the only way to visualize it in 3D is, is using a local scene. Um, I want to briefly talk about uh, 3D widgets. Um, most of the widgets that we have, they are kind of agnostic of the view. So they work both in 2D and 3D. They may sometimes behave a little bit differently uh, than in between the views, but Right now, so this is kind of the, the first one that we have specifically in 3D and it works significantly different than from what you're used to. So this is the measurement tool, the line, like the point to point direct line measurement. Um, if you're familiar with measurement in 2D, um, this is the 3D version of that. And, and it works kind of different. So I want to show you 
um, kind of how that works. You saw it, in, you saw it already in the screenshot. Again, this is a sample on the SDK. You can, you can look at this by yourself uh, later if you want to. So I'm doing this with touch. So basically, I have to first add a, a first point. And then I'll, I'll measure basically, let's see, like I want to measure up until here. So, so what happens here that in 3D, there's not only a horizontal distance. Obviously, there's also vertical distance. Um, but more than that, there's also a difference between measuring horizontally or kind of like from point to point, we call that direct measurement. And here this tool will allow you to do these measurements all at the same time and visualize them in a way that it's intuitive in 3D. Um, I can edit also this measurement. Um, so if I, if I grab this, I can, I can run this and it's all interactive, right? So this all at the, at the same moment. Um, so if I zoom out, I just wanted to show kind of the, the other mode. Um, so we also have a like, geodesic measurement. So it kind of, the tool automatically switches intelligently between the two modes. Uh, one we call Euclidean distance measurement. This is geodesic. So you'll see that it kind of like goes around the globe, sorry. All right, in this, in this case, there's no more vertical measurement. We only show you the, the horizontal measurement in the view. If you are interested in the widget, we'll still show you also the vertical displacement. So now um, we would like to switch to kind of a more concrete example of a couple of steps that use various parts of the API that's very specific to 3D to build out a very small app. And, and we'll show some of the newer features of the API that we've not really talked about uh, so far in Dev Summit. Cool, thanks Jesse. So yeah, this scene is a web scene in Lyon, in France. And basically the end result is what you see in this screenshot, but let's go step by step. The first thing we do here is uh, loading the scene layer, the buildings and with textures, as you see, and a point layer, which is a feature layer. You see that at the bottom of the code snippet, it's a feature layer that is loaded as an item. So you notice that I have portal item and an ID and, in, and just by, Pasting the ID there, we will grab the service and we will load that to the, into the scene. And then the other thing I'm doing, if you notice at the bottom, is setting a render. And that's the render I'm defining up there uh, at the top of the, of the code snippet. And all that's doing is changing it to a unique value render. This I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, so that's basically it works the same that, that it would work into the, the unique value render. The next thing I want to show you is uh, the elevation info. Uh, yes, I talked about it before. We saw on the ground, which means it's draped on the ground, so projected on the surface. Or it's relative to ground, which means it's aligned to the ground surface. Or it's absolute height, so if your data has Z values. In this case, this is a new elevation mode that's called relative to scene. And this is very useful for cities where you have 3D data, like these buildings, and you have points that are potentially at the same location of the building. And so what happens is that those points are actually hidden by the building. So by enabling rel relative to scene elevation mode, you see that some of these points now appear. They were actually under the buildings. Notice here, this, this one in the corner. That's a, that's a restaurant in that building. And, when, and obviously when we have a 3D geometry is hidden, but when I, when I enable relative to scene mode, what, Sorry about that. When I enable relative to scene mode, that point now appears in the scene. So this is very useful because you don't have to do anything to make your points display on the roofs of the 3D geometry, whether it's scene layer 3D object or scene layer integrated mesh. Another property that we added uh, last year is uh, capability for decluttering the view. Uh, in this example, we have a lot of points of interest and we're not so interested in seeing all of them at the same time because your view can get really busy. If you zoom out, there's a ton of things here and it looks kind of cluttered and clunky. So if you apply this uh, property that you see at the, uh, in, the, in the code that's called feature reduction, when I enable it, we, we will automatically remove all the points that are overlapping with each other in the 3D scene. So you see now there are fewer points, but as you zoom in, we, all those points are coming back. Notice, uh, zooming out, the points disappear, and zooming in, the points come back, because when, whenever the points don't, don't overlap with each other. 
Feature reduction is uh, actually something that we, pro we plan to expand in the future. You saw in the plenary how in JavaScript in 2D you can apply clustering, for example. So feature reduction will have more options in the future as well. Right now we only have the property of uh, automatic uh, feature reduction or selection. Another important feature that we added last year to, to manage to, to create this scene that I showed at the beginning is improved perspective or screen size perspective. What does that, what that does, sorry, is you see here in this view, for example, all the points are the same size. However, some points are very near to you, to the viewer, and some points are actually really far in the distance. But this is not noticeable because all the points are, I don't know, 10 pixels, five pixels wide. So with improved perspective, what we do is allow, allow you to better see the depth of those points. Where are they? The, the ones in the back are very, are very small and the ones in the front are the same size. Do you notice the difference? The ones in the back, now they're all the same size and now they're very small. And this obviously depends on your camera position. So if you look from the top, for example, all the points are the same size, but as you tilt, the ones in the back are gonna get a bit smaller. And if you go there, actually, they will become bigger again. So this is the, that, that feature automatic um, perspective. The next thing to add to this sample is callouts. And why would you need callouts? Uh, let's go back to this restaurant. Here we have this restaurant here on top of the roof, which is great, but actually, if you notice, we have more restaurants in the street that we didn't see before, right? There's, there's some points there that are actually hidden by 3D geometry because we have these buildings that are covering the street, obviously. So with callouts, what we're gonna do is lift those points up so that you can see them even if they are in the street. Notice? how they, they pop up now, pop out from the, from the street. Just by applying uh, what we see in the code here, a vertical offset, uh, we give it a, a string length of 30 pixels, and we, we give it a callout, which is a, a new property. Uh, we have to define the color of the callout, the size of the callout, and the border. And then those lines, those vertical lines will, will appear. Yes, I already talked about a little bit about 3D models, but this scene also contains some of them in this uh, very nice bridge here in the city center. So here I'm, I'm using actually a unique value render and each of the points has a different web style symbol. So these are coming from this web style gallery that Yes showed before. Sorry about that. And you can see how they, they basically load uh, different types of transportation symbols from trams to cars, even the light, light um, poles on the street, they're loading from the ESRI provided uh, symbol gallery. And, that, uh, and, uh, and a very important part is the web scene. Web scene, uh, like Jesse mentioned, it's the serialization format of, of, this, of this map that we created. So everything I did now with all these different code parts can actually be done with the scene viewer or with Pro. Not everything, there are some small details that, that are not yet supported in the scene viewer. But basically you can create all your layers, all your symbology, all your elevation modes, and then save it in the scene viewer and then load it in your app and save a lot of code. And that's what I did here. What you see, I'm loading a web scene from a portal item ID and then just setting it, um, setting it to the map. And with this, we get exact same um, visualization that I saw before. Instead of writing all that code, I just, I just load a web scene. But then you say, well, what am I gonna do with the code anymore? I, I created the web scene, I don't need to write any more JavaScript code. Well, actually, like I mentioned, some features are not supported in Pro or the C viewer. And one of them is, for example, configuring pop-ups. So here's where the API can come in. You can load the web scene as, as we did before, but now I would like to configure a pop-up template. So you can go through the layers, find the layer that you wanna configure uh, inside the web scene, change the pop-up template like we see here, and then it will just reconfigure the web scene that you're loading. So you have a base, and then you can reconfigure the pop-up or add an extra layer or change the symbology. You can just add things on top of the web scene. This is very useful. We use this a lot uh, internally for our samples, for our demos. We create a base web scene, and then we add things on top 
for different presentations and different demos. This is very useful technique um, starting from a web scene. And the other part of this code snippet, uh, very important, is the portal part, uh, the, the bottom half. So here I'm, I'm connecting to portal, um, which will actually launch an authentication um, dialog. And then saving the web scene is as simple as, as what you see before uh, at the bottom, web scene as. You give it a title, you give it the portal instance, and it will save back your changes so that when somebody opens a web scene somewhere else, not in your application, but in the scene viewer, in a story map, that pop-up template will, will show up as well. With this, let me switch back to the slides. And quickly talk about what's new, what's coming in the next release. A very important one that uh, I actually mentioned in the plenary already, and, and uh, a lot of people are very excited about. Uh, as you notice, we did this whole presentation on the iPad. This was a little bit of a test for us as well. Um, we are releasing mobile support in the next release in 4.7. This, um, this is super exciting for us. We put a lot of effort and a lot of work into making performance and stability and, and, and very, very, very good. Uh, and in the next release, we're very confident that uh, it will work very well for you. We support officially four devices, to iOS, to Android. We want to add more devices in the future, of course. It's a matter of time, resources, uh, money to buy devices. Um, but we are uh, seeing that it actually works in many, many modern phones and tablets. So give it a try in the next release in April. Don't try it yet. It's not released. So in the current release, we still have some performance problems, some stability problems. But in April, when it comes out, uh, it will be much better. And what we do recommend is that you use a phone that at least has two gigabytes of RAM uh, it's better if it, has, if it has four gigabytes of RAM, because what happens is when you load all these buildings, the OS of these mobile devices very quickly shut down the application because you're spiking half of the RAM very quickly with one gigabyte of RAM. And then the device says, well, I need the other half for running the OS and in, in, in all the other applications. So yeah, just the, this is very important aspect. Get a, a phone or a, or a mobile device that has at least two gigabytes of RAM with a good GPU and then you'll be good to go. And please give us feedback. If, if you find that it's uh, not working at all in, in some of your devices or it's working really well uh, and you didn't expect that, we, we would like to hear from you. Um, let us know. Another one important uh, thing in, in 4.7 that's coming out is the 3D area measurement tool. You saw also the example in the plenary. It works very similar to what you saw, uh, what Jesse showed with uh, direct line measurement. Uh, basically, you just tap a few points in the scene and it will create a 3D measurement or uh, a 2D measurement of the area, but it's lifted in, in 3D. And this area measurement also works in, in surfaces of buildings. So if you need to measure the facade of a building or the roof area, it will also work in, in 3D planes, not only on the ground. A really, really cool feature that we are releasing is edge rendering. Uh, also showed that video in the plenary in a live demo. We're going to cover that in detail in a session tomorrow morning at 10.30. I really recommend you go there if you want to learn more about edge rendering, uh, 3D visualization with the RGS API for JavaScript. And one more thing for developers. Like, 3D developers almost, uh, a little bit advanced, is the Mesh Geometry API. In the API, currently we support point geometry, line geometry, polygon geometry. You can add this to the graphics layer. What we didn't have until now is Mesh Geometry, so that you can create your own 3D object on the client and add it into the scene. This is pretty cool because it allows you to, for example, create a vertical image, something that a lot of people have asked. We, we want to visualize vertical imagery, or we want to have a uh, a billboard on the, on, the, on the road next to the road when, when I have my buildings. So Mesh Geometry allows you to do things like this and much more. Uh, yes, I will we'll talk about that tomorrow afternoon. So that's all we, we wanted to cover today. Uh, we really thank you for your, atten for your attendance, for your attention, and for your interest in 3D, in 3D web mapping. We're very excited to see what you guys build with the API. Please don't forget to, to take the service. Uh, you have the, the phone app and we now open it up for questions. Yep. Of 
Cool. Uh, good question. So the question is if in the clutter we can actually label the how many restaurants were removed, right? How many of restaurants are hidden? And this is uh, actually what we would call clustering more than decluttering. What we do is just remove everything that collides with, uh, with each other without really doing any additional uh, processing. This uh, feature would be rather more in the clustering area and that's something that we need to look into. But in, in 3D, it's really complicated to know where does your group end in a tilted view. In 3D, it's very easy. You just get like a extent, and then everything that's in that extent is in one cluster. In 3D, it's a little bit more tricky. So that's, that's one of the reasons why we didn't release it yet. But that's something we're looking into for sure. Thanks. Yes? Uh, the question is if it's possible to add 3D, your custom 3D symbols to the Esri gallery. And the answer is no, not to the Esri gallery, but yes to the scene. So if you have your own symbol, you can definitely use it in, in, the, in the API. The only process is you have to go through Pro to be able to convert that symbol to the format that we can read. This is a specific format that, that we have. And, and then you need to publish that symbol and then you can, you can actually use it in the API. If you need more details on how to do that, come back, uh, come, come to us and we can tell you a little bit more about it after the session. Anybody on that side and look that way? Yep. So the question is if you can integrate the 3D area widget in your own custom widget, or you want to use the geometry engine. Yeah. Uh, so the question is if we can, if we provide the geometry engine for developers, and the answer is no. We don't. We don't have a 3D geometry engine per se. And the tool you can use in the API. I think the UI is is not together, right? Yes, sir. No, so it has the, the view model uh, widget separation, so you could write your own view, but it's still using the same measurements. If you want to do calculate your own measurements, so we do use some 2D parts of the geometry engine internally to do the, the calculations, but in the end, the actual 3D like aspects of those calculations, they are not part of the geometry engine uh, at this point. So yeah, th those you would have to do by yourself if you really want to like, provide your complete own calculations and experience. Yes? So the question is if portal is required and what is the minimum version of, of which part of, of RGI server? Uh, the answer is not that it's not required. Portal is not required. However, if you need 3D services, then you need to have Portal. Uh, RGI server doesn't doesn't have scene service support. This was uh, only added to Portal and Pro in 10.3. So you will have to have Pro and Portal to be able to publish a scene layer, either point cloud, integrated mesh, or 3D object. Uh, if you don't need 3D buildings, you, if you just want to have 2D polygons extruded or 2D points with a 3D symbol cars or even cylinders with the statistical data, you don't need portal uh, for any of it. So, so scene layers are only served for portal, they're not served That's correct, yeah. Scene layers are only coming from, well, actually they can be only hosted in portal um, and RGS online, of course. So maybe that's another way to make it work. Even if you have your own RGS server, you can host the, RG, the scene layers in RGS Online. In RGS Online, you can upload your multi-patch and it will generate the scene layer for you, or you can generate it in Pro and, and, and upload the SFPK, the scene layer package. Sure. Yes? Yeah, 
So the question is, how does the scene layer impact the performance of the rest of the application, like the feature limit that we have for 2,000 features? Do you want to take it? Yeah. Um, so, so the scene layer, so in terms of performance, so the scene layer usually has very heavy data requirements, so there's a lot of content. Uh, in terms of how it affects the performance, like overall you will see that yes, it does have a performance impact, so there's much more data to render. It doesn't really affect at all the other parts of the application though, so the, the, the feature limit is still in place. Uh, like the scene server and the scene layer, they are really a separate kind of data source. Now, this feature limitation, we are going to work on this, so we are working on this already now. Um, this is one of our highest priority things that we want to resolve, uh, where you can just load basically as many features as you can see in your view. There will be limitations, but they will be based more on memory consumption and things like that. Uh, and we'll load the features that you can see, but not the other ones. So basically, it's kind of a similar pattern as we already do for the scene layers, uh, and that will lift this, this limitation of the number of features. Yes. One, one important comment, in the next release of, of the scene viewer, we're going to add a guide page to the documentation that has a little bit of uh, guide, and, uh, or guide topic, but a little bit of best practices of what to do to improve the performance of your scene. Um, do you think that's helpful? Yeah, it's things like yeah, don't you know, don't use very complex symbols, or you know, don't load too many layers at the same time. If you if you don't need them, try to turn them off. Elevation layers. There's there's a couple of best practices that we have identified. Uh, hopefully that helps. Okay. Any last minute question? Well, then let's wrap it up. Thanks a lot again for coming and see you around.